SpaceX started the week with the successful launch of another batch of 60 satellites for its Starlink constellation, bringing the total number of deployed satellites to just about 300. This week, it was also announced that SpaceX will launch four Space Adventures clients aboard Crew Dragon on a free flyer mission as early as 2021. And in Boca Chica, there's a lot of visible progress as Starship SN1 takes form. Starship Update Major Stacking in Progress on Monday, February 17th, the methane tank section, which is comprised of five rings and a mated bulkhead, was mated to the four-ring stack midsection to form a substantial and towering section of the hull. There was a bit of a nerve-wracking moment for SpaceX fans during attachment of these two sections when suddenly a dent appeared during mating. Shortly after the issue emerged, however, SpaceX rapidly solved the problem. Over the weekend, on Sunday, February 16, a double ring stack was mated to the three-ring engine section stack. In the coming days, if not hours, we could expect to see mating of that engine section with the nine-stack tank section. 20-kilometer test flight coming soon. If the team in Boca Chica continues with this accelerated rate of progress, then we could expect the 20-kilometer test to happen within the time frame set by SpaceX and Elon, as early as March 2020 and before September. According to details unveiled by founder of the Mars Society and author of The Case for Space, Dr. Robert Zubrin, who visited Boca Chica recently, after the 20-kilometer test flight, a possible 100-kilometer test flight could follow. The progress that SpaceX has made in recent months is impressive. Just about three months ago, the team in Boca Chica pivoted away from the Mark 1 Starship design and transitioned to the new SN1 design. Now, we're at the point where we can visibly see many of the parts of the towering hull come together. Starlink Update on Monday, February 17th, SpaceX successfully launched a fourth batch of 60 version 1 satellites for its Starlink constellation. The launch took place at 10.05 a.m. Eastern Standard Time from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. SpaceX took a bit of a different approach on this Starlink launch, this time deploying the satellites into an elliptical orbit just 15 minutes after launch, shortly after the first burn of the second stage. On previous Starlink launches, the satellites were deployed at an altitude of 290 kilometers into a circular orbit. This required two burns of the second stage engine. Through the change, SpaceX aims to reduce the stress on Falcon 9 rockets and improve on the challenges associated with recovery. Fastest turnaround time of a booster ever. As I mentioned in the previous episode, the mission utilized a thrice flown Falcon 9 booster, B1056. The booster supporting this mission previously supported CRS 17, CRS 18, and JCSAT 18 Pacific 1. With this launch, SpaceX has successfully set a personal record and achieved a reusability milestone for the fastest turnaround time of a booster ever. Booster Landing While SpaceX did manage to achieve a reusability milestone on this launch in one way, the booster also missed its landing target. The booster was expected to land on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You out in the Atlantic Ocean. However, this time, this proved unsuccessful. The booster, however, did come close to Of Course I Still Love You, soft landing at sea near the drone ship. There hasn't been any official word from SpaceX or Elon just yet on why the booster missed the drone ship this time. There also hasn't been any official confirmation on the status of the fairings. According to spaceflight photographer John Cross on Twitter though, the fairings were not recovered this time. SpaceX does appear to be making an attempt to recover the booster though, as Mystery Mischief and Go Quest were spotted near the booster landing zone on Tuesday, February 18th, following the drifting booster. Over the past four years, since the first successful landing of a Falcon 9 booster in December 2015, SpaceX has come a long way in terms of reusability. We're at the point where booster landings now seem routine, and the point where a booster missing a landing is surprising. We expect it to land. This just speaks volumes of the amount of progress SpaceX has made over the years and the impact of the company's innovations in terms of changing the perspective of the space industry. Crew Dragon Update the Crew Dragon capsule supporting Demo 2 has now arrived in Florida. Capsule C206 arrived at the Cape last week Thursday. On Sunday, February 16, a photo was shared via SpaceX's Twitter of the capsule undergoing acoustic testing. During direct field acoustic excitation or direct field acoustic testing, a test article or spacecraft is surrounded or encircled by acoustic drivers, usually high-performance speakers, amplifiers, and control technology. The acoustic drivers are used to subject the spacecraft to a uniform field of sound or pressure waves of varying intensities. 
Acoustic tests are designed to mimic the environment the spacecraft is expected to encounter during launch. According to a NASA Technical Handbook 7010, current DFAT technology is capable of producing broadband sound pressures with overall sound pressure level of 145 to 147 decibels for 30 seconds. As sound intensity decreases, the amount of exposure time for the test can increase. Launch providers usually provide information on payload acoustic limits via launch vehicle user guides. Other SpaceX and New Space updates. This week, there's some exciting news for potential space tourists. On Tuesday, February 18th, space tourism company Space Adventures announced an agreement with SpaceX to launch up to four private citizens on Dragon. The mission will be a free flyer mission. The spacecraft will not dock with the ISS. According to Space Adventures co-founder and chairman Eric Anderson, this Dragon mission will be a special experience and a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity capable of reaching twice the altitude of any prior civilian astronaut mission or space station visitor. The altitude record for high apogee Earth orbit flights currently stands at 850 miles. This record was achieved by the Gemini 11 crew, Pete Conrad and Richard Gordon. Anderson went on to clarify on Twitter, stating that the flight will attempt to reach two to three times higher altitude than the station. At an altitude of three times the ISS, the view is approximately 10x. In a response to the announcement, President and COO of SpaceX Gwen Shotwell stated that this historic mission will forge a path to making spaceflight possible for all people who dream of it. And we are pleased to work with Space Adventures team on the mission. The five-day mission is expected to launch sometime between late 2021 to mid-2022. Space Adventures was founded in 1998. Since 2001, the company has so far launched seven clients on eight separate missions aboard Russia's Soyuz rocket. Some of its clients include Denis Tito, the first space tourist, Anusha Ansari, the first female private astronaut and sponsor of the Ansari X Prize, and the co-founder of Cirque du Soleil, Gila Liberté. Despite the setback with the landing of booster B1056 this week, SpaceX achieved its primary mission with the successful launch of another batch of 60 satellites for Starlink Constellation. As was mentioned on the SpaceX livestream, the goal is of course to reduce the turnaround time between these booster flights in order to have a rapidly reusable rocket and increase launch rates, a goal that SpaceX is committed to and one that will be extremely important to inform the future development of Starship where a fully reusable rocket is the primary design driver. For now though, the company continues its progress, continually innovating and taking the next steps in its attempt to make humanity a spacefaring civilization.